morning. I'm Congresswoman Jackie Spear from California, and I'm here to deliver a seemingly innocuous message. Take an aspirin and go to bed. Now, that kind of advice may be good for a headache, but when that's the prescription by the military to one of its soldiers that has been a victim of assault or rape, take an aspirin and go to bed. We've got a problem. It's what Terry Odom, a young Marine, was told after her superior officer raped and mutilated her. Take an aspirin and go to bed. Other victims have been told to sleep it off, to work out your differences. Over the years, the response have varied, but in the end, the message has always been the same. Don't push this complaint. I want to remind all of the survivors who are here that you are courageous by your presence here, that by being here you are giving voices to tens of thousands of victims across this country that have been violated as well, and that the pursuit of justice never ends. This silent epidemic is over, and your voices will be heard. I also want to acknowledge the groups that stand in support of the survivors of military sexual assault and rape. They include the American Civil Liberties Union, Amnesty International, Benefiting Veterans, the Feminist Majority, Equality Now, the Service Women's Action Network, Walk Against Rape, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, the Military Rape Crisis Center, and the National Women's Veterans Association of America. Despite 25 years of task force recommendations, of Pentagon studies, of congressional hearings, rapes and sexual assaults in the military continue unabated. A 2010 Department of Defense survey of active duty members revealed that only a small percentage of the 19,000 victims of sexual assault and rape in the military actually report the crime. And that percentage is 13.5%. And of that percentage, only 8% actually lead to prosecutions. In the end, only 465 service members were administratively discharged or punished through the court martial process. That's about 2.5% of the total suspected acts of sexual assault and rape. Now that may be a good percentage for a direct male response but it's unacceptable in the justice system. Men and women who have been sexually abused in the military have come to realize that military justice is an oxymoron. They are forced to live with their trauma in secret, and that in turn subjects them to a second act of victimization. They suffer while their attackers go unpunished. Instead of justice, we end up with increased diagnoses of PTSD among victims who know what it's like to be told to shut up and take an aspirin. It will only hurt for a lifetime. The failure to respond in a judicial manner to sexual assaults is more than an injustice. It is, according to some of our military leaders, a threat to our military readiness. Members of military units survive on the code of watching out for each other. When sexual assaults and rapes are hushed, ignored, or treated lightly, trust in a unit is compromised along with its collective readiness to engage the enemy. Last week, this man, Michael Robertson, a Fort Bliss colonel, 
was convicted on 14 counts that included sexual harassment and assault. The military court sentenced him to 90 days in jail, a fine and a reprimand. This man is going to be allowed to retire with full benefits, with full rank, with full retirement, and with full health benefits. And he is not going to be required to register on his state's sex offenders registry. The military court's punishment for a serial sex offender is woefully inadequate. Over the past few months, on the floor of the House, I have delivered 12 separate speeches on specific cases of military rape and abuse. I will continue to do so until the military wakes up to the truth. It must end this horrific injustice or face the ramifications of toxic morale, diminished readiness, and the loss of good men and women who enlisted to defend this country. Today I'm announcing that I've introduced H.R. 3435 with 44 co-sponsors, legislation aimed to fundamentally reform the military's chain of command driven justice system. And I'm endorsing the campaign and the website of Protect Our Defenders, a new nonprofit that will be the grassroots mechanism for telling our military leaders and our Congress why our brave men and women in the military deserve a justice system that protects them, not punishes them. The Sexual Assault Training Oversight and Prevention Act, the STOP Act, takes the prosecution, the reporting, the oversight, the investigation, and victim care of sexual assaults out of the hands of the military's normal chain of command and places jurisdiction in the newly created autonomous Sexual Assault Oversight and Response Office, comprised of civilians and military experts. I'm calling for this because the military justice system lacks independence as military judges depend on base commanders to provide the salient facts. These commanders have significant discretion in dealing with accusations of sexual assault. This great deference afforded to command discretion also sets up a dynamic fraught with a conflict of interest and potential abuse of power. The US military's default position regarding any service member's complaint is that they be resolved through the chain of command. According to the Manual for Courts Martial, quote, each commander has discretion to dispose of offenses by members of that command, unquote. Under the STOP Act, a rape and sexual assault victim may report straight to this independent investigative body, or he or she may follow the chain of command with the unit commander, having full responsibility for immediately reporting the alleged act to the Sexual Assault Oversight and Response Office. Significant penalties will be assessed against the commanding officer who fails to report these acts of sexual assault. This campaign is being launched at a time when 20% of all recruits are women. And women now comprise 14% of the military. Our national defense needs the resolve, the determination, and the dedication of both men and women. And as we withdraw our troops from Iraq and Afghanistan, we will be asked a down, asking a downsized military to do more with less. We can't afford conduct that destroys morale and breaks up unit cohesiveness. Simply put, we need to protect our defenders. And I hope to do this with this legislation, this website, and these courageous voices that are seated here and that I'm standing alongside.
now my great pleasure to introduce to you the president of the new nonprofit called Protect Our Defenders. Please welcome the president, Nancy Parrish. Hello, everyone. Months ago, Congresswoman Spear called my attention to this horrible issue. We talked about how to begin a movement for change by amplifying the voices of these honorable service women and men who have been tragically let down by our military, our government, and ultimately by our country, at least so far. From those discussions, Protect Our Defenders was born. I worked with Human Rights Watch and with President and Mrs. Carter in support of their international human rights work. But I have never before encountered a situation where one of America's most revered and most important institutions, our military, has so failed its members. The time to end this madness is now. It's a special privilege to work with some of America's finest, those service members who have survived unpunished sexual assault in the military. And though profoundly sad, it is an honor to work with the families of victims who were murdered or committed suicide after being so brutally attacked. The Protect Our Defenders team has traveled across America to meet survivors and capture their stories. In a moment, you will see a short video representing this effort. On our website, each person talks about their own sense of re-victimization by the military they still love, and they speak of their life-altering sense of betrayal and powerlessness caused by this experience. One survivor put it this way, every time I tell my story, it feels like I'm shedding a layer of skin. It's painful for a moment, but afterward, there is peace. I'm tired of the silence and the shame. If I can help just one service member by speaking out then, it's worth it. We know their collective voices can be powerful. Therefore, we will continue to send film crews around the country to add more and more voices to the courts until the power of numbers builds a powerful movement to force change. However, their voices are not enough. We all have a responsibility to add our collective American voice in calling for action on this issue. Our, one strength of our campaign is our video-centric website. We are building a truly interactive documentary among the first using new hyper-video technology. And we are creating a strong social networking team to build a movement from the ground up. We will begin that effort in collaboration with Survivor Terry, who has started an online petition that demands Congress creates a new method for reporting sexual assault in the military. We hope that thousands of Americans will support her petition, which went online moments ago, so we can mark a victory when it does, as we know it will. As you've no doubt noticed, on the screen is our homepage. As one enters our website, Jackie, our honorary chair, will introduce the issue. This interactive video platform enables people to do more and participate more while watching web video. Here, they can click on any individual and see any of their stories. And let me tell you, these stories, they happened 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Just a few weeks ago, we received a letter from a mom whose daughter is currently serving in Iraq and who is in her unit being mistreated. And her mom is beside herself. Her, the daughter is afraid to go to her commander for what it will do to her career. This has to stop. 
As we continue, you can choose a story. Um, here's Jenny, and, her, and it's her personal story. Or you can access deeper information by clicking on a question, going to a petition, and as you can see up in the top left corner, Jenny's story is still there in video. You can sign the petition to go online. Uh, you can dig deeper in information. You can ask questions. What happens to a victim when they report the crime? What happens to a per perpetrator? This allows you to go in and hear what each survivor tells you of what happened to them when, when they reported their crime, when they, what happened to their perpetrator. Viewers can choose their own path through the documentary, selecting a story to follow, an answer to a specific question, or take action. This interactive, nonlinear documentary will grow, and the website will evolve as we collect more stories and the movement gathers momentum. Now, let's take a moment and let these remarkable individuals speak for themselves. Can I follow up? Does conflicts apply for every crime in the military? 
Actually, the chain of command has worked pretty well as it relates to other crimes. Uh, it has worked very poorly as it relates to sexual assault and rape. I do not have an estimated cost, but let me put it this way. How much does it cost to provide PTSD treatment for a victim for 30 or 40 years? The loss of productivity that results, the loss of the training when a victim is actually taken from the service, you know, the stunning statistic is that of those that report, that 13% that report, 90% of them are involuntarily, honorably discharged. These are women and men who enlisted in the military because they wanted to serve their country and make a military career. And because they become a victim of sexual assault and have the, the audacity to report it, they are labeled as personality disorders and forced to leave the military. Yes? Because the members of the military who are victims of sexual assault receive so few more services than their civilian counterparts, is there a talk about actually taking this outside the military code of justice um, and actually bringing crimes of sexual assault into the federal system? I think the most important thing we can do is make sure that the Veterans Administration recognizes these individuals as needing services and provides those services to them. Some of these victims, who I, I hesitate to call them survivors because they continue to be victimized, um, are forced to sign documents that preclude them from even accessing services through the Veterans Administration. Yes? Um, I see a lot of Californians as co-sponsors, but noticeably absent are the two who sit on the Armed Services Committee. Have you spoken with Mr. McKeon or Loretta Sanchez about co-sponsoring? I have um, spoken with them. I, I have spoken with Ms. Sanchez about the, legislate, about the issue. I have not yet talked to her about the legislation. Um, that was, I was able to, to generate 44 co-sponsors in less than a day. So, I think given the opportunity, given an opportunity um, to talk to more members, I am, I am fairly confident that this will become a bipartisan piece of legislation. Do you have a spoken with Mr. McKean? I have not yet spoken to Mr. McKean. Hi, some of the response that you've heard from those who have been in active military service. I mean, there's a military justice system that has existed since the beginning of time. And retaining it within that justice system, I think, is critical to the success of this effort. I might also point out that in other countries, in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, they have dealt with this issue head on. They've dealt with this issue head on, and within the military system, they've either created a separate entity to provide the services and to provide the prosecutions. And this is, in my belief, the way we must go. Any other questions? A lot of these problems we knew were going to happen when we started integrating females and traditionally male parts of the military. Was, was, this the, was this considered an acceptable risk? I mean, are we telling women who enlist in the military now that there is no risk? 
I mean, it's, it's, it seems like you're never going to zero out this kind of sexual assault. Wait, well, hold, hold on. Wait a second. <laughs> First of all, the military system is a system based on discipline. Right. These are adults. Okay. There are people that operate in many situations like this in which if this was happening in the private sector, the perpetrator would be fired and the victim would be provided services. We have just the reverse happening in the military. Now, this has been going on for 25 years and probably much longer. But for 25 years, we have reported accounts. And the problem is that we allow it to continue to happen unabated. Yeah, not, and let me also point out to you that it's not just women. It happens to men, too, and a number of our victims, survivors, are men. Right, but the vast majority are women. And we knew this was going to happen on ships. We knew this was going to happen in combat zones. Did you consider it an acceptable risk when you supported integrating women into these areas? Oh, my God. Can I suggest to you that it is not an acceptable risk? That violence against another human being is not acceptable. <laughs> Because right. of the stress, because of the close quarters, you knew this was going to happen. <laughs> this gentleman always, obviously has his own agenda. Thank you all. I, if we'll, we'll be around. If you have any more questions, we're here. Thank you for Thank coming. You.